morning and welcome back to the lecture series on performative gender and religions in South Asia. So, today we are going to start with a new module called Bhakti Sufi and Cinema. So, we have already discussed uh, the uh, core philosophy informing the Bhakti and the Sufi cults or the Bhakti and the Sufi movements. We have discussed the uh, major poets from both these movements. Now, let us uh, see the filmic adaptations of the uh, Bhakti and Sufi codes in uh, uh, cinema in the Indic context and uh, uh, by extension in the South Asian context, right. We will mainly focus on the uh, films that are produced that are made in India which have the, uh, the influence of uh, Bhakti codes and the, the Bhakti philosophy as well as the Sufi codes and Sufi philosophy. So, let us uh, start by looking at some of the uh, critics, how they understand the Bhakti philosophy. A. K. Ramanujan for example writes that the Bhakta needs to possess him, here referring to God and be possessed by him. So, uh, basically uh, it is a kind of interreciprocatory relationship between the devoted and the devotee uh, and further Ramanujan says he also uh, needs to sing, to dance, to make poetry, painting, shrines, sculpture to embody him in every possible way. So, we have already discussed in our previous modules that Bhakti does not uh, abide by the idea of worshipping the shadow of one's mind or the uh, formless Brahman. It uh, basically thrives uh, with the idea of worshipping God as a personalized humanized uh, existence, right. In the, as, as a lover, as a, a teacher, as a, one's child, as one's uh, master and so forth, right. In some kind of relationship, it could be the relationship of a friend, a lover, uh, a husband, a teacher and so forth. So, these all these relationships entail uh, some kind of bhav. It could be the Sakya bhav, the, the Madhurya bhav, the Dasya bhav uh, and so forth. So, Bhakti has been called as a less God fearing and more God possessed uh, mode of devotion by critic Arundhati Subramaniam. Over the years, the cinema referring to Indian cinema here, uh, the cinema has been a medium for expressing the Bhakti and Sufi worldviews and uh, uh, cinema is responsible for interspersing these philosophies with the uh, core filmic narrative. So, within the filmic narrative, we see certain performances being made which uh, are deeply inspired by both uh, Bhakti and uh, Sufi. Uh, metaphysics, Bhakti and Sufi worldviews. Song dance performances have played uh, crucial parts in such depictions in filmic narratives. Cinema therefore, uh, gave a platform, a medium to dance uh, and, and uh, music for the expression of spirituality through performative mode, right. Through performance, uh, as, as observable in cinema, as observable in the uh, song dance sequences in uh, cinema, the ideas of uh, Bhakti and Sufi uh, were propagated sometimes in the traditional sense and sometimes as we will see uh, uh, through a hybridized and diluted uh, manner, right, through a hybridized uh, uh, diluted uh, manner, uh, through subversion of the core uh, ideas. So, we will start looking at different uh, films where the influence of Bhakti is available. One such film uh, is uh, by Bhavra, uh, made in 1952, uh, where we had a number of songs that resonated with the ideas of the Bhakti tradition. A song like uh, Odunya Ke Rakhwale and uh, Mantarpat Haridarshan Kuaj. Uh, these bhajans basically express the urge and the longing uh, 
uh, to experience the divinity of God. Uh, there is the imagination of a personalized, humanized God uh, as experienced through the figure of the preceptor or guru. So, uh, Bhaiji Bhavra particularly emphasizes on this teacher-disciple relationship. The video of Mantarpata uh, shows the relation of Guru Shishya or teacher and student where the Shishya is uh, beseeching, requesting for God's appearance and also curing uh, the Guru through his song. The student sings brilliantly, he is an extraordinary singer and the song is informed by a strong bhakti spirit where a revelation of uh, Krishna or uh, Murali Manohar, uh, his idol, uh, happens almost as soon as the Guru appears. So, in the song we see that the Guru appears and at the same time uh, Murali Manohar's uh, or Krishna's uh, idol uh, becomes available in front of the screen uh, and uh, to the Shishya. So, uh, it implies that God and teacher are one and the same, right? So, the, the student through his song had been longing to get a glimpse of uh, Hari. And who is this Hari? We see that simultaneously the teacher walks out of his room and emerges in front of his sight and the, the idol of Madan Mohan or Murali Manohar is also uh, exposed. Uh, so, one's identity is transposed onto the other. Teacher is the same as uh, Hari here. So, the power of love of the Shishya can be seen when the Guru is finally cured uh, by his moving bhajan, by his highly dedicated and passionate bhajan. And lyrics like Tumhare dwar ka main hu jogi hamare aur nazar kab hogi. So, I am uh, the uh, ascetic or the sage uh, standing at your door. Uh, when will I see you again? Roughly, this is the translation of this lyrics. So, the reference to Nazar and Darshan uh, are concepts that are highly prevalent both in Bhakti and Sufi traditions, the consummation of a love relationship uh, through eye contact. Uh, that uh, element, that code is available in this bhajan. There is also a reference to the restless soul, mantarapat. So, the soul is restless uh, uh, and uh, the devotee's soul uh, yearns for the God's sight and uh, it can only be pacified through the uh, God's appearance. It is the same as the Guru's appearance. Through the Guru's appearance, he can feel the appearance of the divinity, right? So, then in another bhajan from the same film by Jibhavra, we see uh, the lyrics. Uh, so, in uh, O Dunya Ke Rakhwale, there are uh, lyrics like, Ab to neer bahale, uh, so you shed tears for my pain. And then uh, the, the singer, the devotee says, uh, Bhagavan bhala ho tera. It's a way of provoking God's guilt for not reciprocating to the call of the devotee and for not uh, pacifying or allaying his pain. So, here we see that when the uh, devotee beseeches or even demands that the God should shed tears at uh, his pathos, at his, uh, at, at his pain and even uh, in a way we could say he is uh, cursing God for being so stoic, for not reciprocating. He, the devotee says, Bhagavan bhala ho tera. May uh, you all, you be happy that you are not responding to me. May you be happy, right? This is how the devotee is addressing to God. Uh, here, the position of the devotee is on an equal platform with the devoted. The hierarchy is almost uh, lost. And here is a video from the song uh, Mantarpat Hari Darshan Ko Aaj, where uh, this is the denouement, the climax of the song where uh, the devotee says Murali Manohar Asana Toro and uh, the guru who was unable to walk uh, through the magic of his performance through by listening to his uh, song, the guru is able to walk once again and come and uh, appears in front of the shishya. 
So then next we see the song from film Seema made in 1955 which shows uh, some people gathered together to pray to God. There is uh, the icon of uh, Lord Krishna and uh, the song defines God as an ocean of love, Pyarka Sagar and the devotee is thirsty or longing for uh, its uh, single drop. So, it represents a very persistent uh, uh, love of the devotee towards uh, the God where the bhakta or the devotee is reluctant to return without receiving God's uh, reciprocation, without receiving God's uh, love. Uh, and then further we see that the song addresses God as Tu which is a very intimate form of addressing uh, someone that uh, we are very close to. So, here we do not see the concept of a distant and a fearful God, uh, that kind of a God uh, which we are supposed to uh, uh, you know rever is not available uh, in, in the terminology and in the expressions of bhakti. Uh, the bhakti's God is uh, a lover, a very uh, close and dear relationship and uh, so one speaks to God as if talking to one's uh, beloved. Next, we have a bhajan from Shagird, a film that was made in 1967. Uh, the song goes like this, Kanha an padi me tere dwar. So, this song is sung from the point of view of the devotee, the female devotee who wants Krishna to accept her as uh, his servant. So, the dasya bhav of Mirabai is very much evident in this song, especially as there is a juxtaposition of Mira with Radha. This is a very common device, uh, a common trope that uh, comes back again and again in uh, Mira Bhajan. There are a number of songs uh, made in Bollywood uh, in different decades where this juxtaposition is uh, available. One such song is Radha ka bhi sham hai to Mira ka bhi sham. Then ek Radha ek Mira dono ne sham ko chaha and so forth. So, the two kinds of love where one is celebrating, the Radha's love is celebrating uh, uh, Sringar right uh, and Madhurya. Whereas, uh, Mira's love is celebrating the Dasya Bhav, the servile uh, uh, emotion or attitude right. So, these two kinds of loves are constantly juxtaposed in uh, Mira Bhajan. Similarly, we see uh, this, this trope being used in Kanha Anpari Me Tere Dwar. So, the song uh, goes like this, Tu jise chahe vaisi nahi mein, aha teri radha jaisi nahi mein, phir bhi hu kaisi kaisi nahi mein, Krishna mohe dekh to le ek bar, right. So, uh, the kind of uh, lover that you seek, O Krishna, I am not like her, I am not exactly like your Radha, but still uh, how I am, uh, can you see once and, and uh, tell if I am good enough? So, the concept of darshan comes back again. There is a desire in the devotee that Krishna, uh, this figure of a transcendental Rasika and the beautiful human God, see her. He, he direct his gaze at her once uh, and this uh, refers to the concept of darshan, the bhakti concept of darshan and depicts a sensuous God that loves and hungers for devotees love and this kind of love once again is very sensory in nature. It can be touched, it can be seen, it can be heard and so forth. It, it appeals to the five senses. Then we see that the song Kana An Pari Me Tere Dwar uh, expresses a, a complete surrender and utter uh, dedication towards the end of the bhajan. Uh, this is how it goes. I will read the original and then I uh, will translate it to English. Mati karo ya swarn banalo, tanko mere charno se lagalo, murli samaj haatho me uthalo. So, uh, when translated, you turn me into dust or gold, bring me to your feet, pick me up as your flute. These lines reflect uh, the essence of bhakti where attaining 
uh, of God happens through uh, traversing the path of love and through uh, complete surrender uh, to him, right? Uh, once again, bhakti, uh, the path of bhakti or the bhakti marg uh, is different from the jnana marg. It is, uh, so it, God is not uh, uh, attained through scriptural knowledge. It is through sheer love, through a rapturous uh, and ecstatic performance uh, for uh, God that the knowledge of God can be uh, attained. Next, we come to a bhajan uh, from the film Gopi that was made in 1970. Uh, it's a bhajan uh, that goes like Sukh ke sab sathi dukh me na koi. It centers uh, a scene of prayer to God and uh, we have such uh, prayer songs uh, as very common presentations uh, or, or uh, you know uh, very common performances uh, that are inserted in the uh, filmic narrative in the 1970s decade. It uh, adds to the spiritual quotient of the film and the spiritual message that the film is trying to convey. Here in the case of Sukh Ke Sab Sathi, we see uh, a group of people sitting in the vicinity of a temple or uh, sitting in a temple complex with the lead character, the protagonist, singing and praying to God. The song is about selfless love towards God with the image of uh, Hanuman uh, being focused towards the beginning of the uh, song, uh, uh, Hanuman sitting at the feet of Rama, Lakshman and Sita. The song is evocative of the ideals proposed by Ram Rajya and it focuses on the Dasya Bhav or the servile love that uh, Hanuman feels for uh, Rama. It's in a way, uh, you know, proposing a kind of an ideal society uh, that, that became a dream of um, post-independent India, the, the dream of the nationalists especially. These films have the, the tendency to support the, uh, the nationalist dream of an ideal uh, post-independent nation right an organized society and so uh, the the evocation of ram rajya the idol of ram sita lakshman with hanuman at the feet uh, becomes a common trope uh, seen in different bhajan, bhajans of different films during this era so this is uh, a snippet from the uh, bhajan where we see the idols of uh, ram sita and lakshman and uh, you know the devotee, the leading singer, uh, singing in the temple complex. So the song promotes the concept of an egalitarian society through uh, uh, a reference or allusion to the Ram Rajya or, or Rama's uh, unparalleled and, and uh, ideal kingdom. There is a, a proposal, a desire for an egalitarian society uh, in the eye of the God, the rich and the poor are the same. They meet the same end. Uh, they die alike, regardless of which class they come from. So death is the ultimate end of everyone, regardless of their class. A society with equality has been a crucial element of the bhakti culture, which was evoked in the uh, nation building process and the films that supported this nation building process in the post uh, independence era. Further, uh, this bhajan encourages detachment from worldly pleasures, calling life uh, and one's embodied existence, one's kaya as a, a, a delusion, a maya and therefore false. So it says that this bodily existence, the material uh, conditions are all delusion. It is uh, temporary and so uh, one should not uh, seek their identity, their permanent identity through the material conditions. One should uh, transcend it and one should concentrate on God. So made in the post-independence era, like I was saying, this bhajan uh, deploys bhakti ideals to shape a new generation of citizenry and audience uh, that is modern in its disposition and yet not 
uh, detached from the traditional values. That is the kind of society which mixes the modern values with the uh, traditional ideas that uh, was desired, uh, that was uh, uh, that was uh, being envisioned. Next, in 1971, we see kind of a new uh, uh, a, a new trend uh, being set by a very popular song from the film Hare Rama Hare Krishna made in 1971. Uh, and it ushered in the hippie culture in bhakti presentation, thereby diluting the traditional uh, sense in which bhakti was understood and presented uh, in the past decades in uh, Indian films. So, this is a kind of, uh, you know, a, a incorporation of the bhakti codes, but to show a westernized hippie uh, culture. Uh, it has got a lot to do with globalization. We need to remember that uh, from the late 1960s and early 1970s, the beauty pageants uh, became very uh, popular. A lot of uh, Indian beauty queens were winning these pageants. They uh, were becoming uh, Miss World, uh, Miss uh, Asia Pacific and uh, so forth. They were uh, bringing home these laurels. So, there were certain modern values and the impact of uh, globalization writ large uh, in the cinematic performances. Uh, the song uh, the Marudam is symptomatic of this uh, change of Bollywood culture, this change in the Bollywood culture. Uh, the song which is uh, shot in an era of globalization is about a carefree life uh, regardless of uh, the world, regardless of the uh, society and uh, intoxication comes to help uh, when one wants to forget the difficulties of life, right? Because the song lyrics go like this, it, it goes like, Dunya ne humko diya kya, dunya se humne liya kya, hum sab ki parwa kare kyo, sab ne hamara kiya kya. So, uh, what has the world uh, done to me? Uh, uh, how has it helped me? And why should I even uh, reciprocate to the society and to the world? A very individualistic stance, a very independent stance is uh, emerging through um, the, the impact of modernity and globalization where uh, the, the traditional Indian value where we see ourselves as part of the collective, the part of the community responsible uh, towards the community, towards community building is being disrupted. So, so it is like uh, the free life uh, that I want to live, right? Protagonist Zinataman, uh, who is a beauty queen uh, and who, who actually uh, brought in uh, some very alternative values, encourages one to take uh, another talk. She says, uh, Dam Marudam. So, uh, she dances with a look of ecstasy on her face and she wears the saffron attire, uh, the color that is uh, traditionally associated with the saints. The song therefore encourages detachment from the world and there is a departure from the traditional bhakti values. The song is presented by lyricist uh, Anand Vakshi and composed by uh, R. D. Burman. Uh, it was originally intended to be a duet with uh, Lata Mangeshkar singing the, uh, the good girls, uh, you know, uh, background and Usha Uthup singing for the bad girl. So, this good girl, bad girl rhetoric uh, was uh, originally uh, envisioned for this, this uh, sequence. However, uh, it was uh, entirely sung by Asha Bhosle in the end, like we know. So, one of the reviewers, Daniel Shiman, says that the song is a montage of creaking synthesizers, psychedelic guitars and vocals nailed by Asha Bhosle in an ear-piercing exposition of sound. Uh, so, Zinat Aman, like I was saying, she was Femina Miss India Asia Pacific in 1970 and she redefined uh, the screen heroine's uh, identity with her westernized image, her hippie-like image. So, she had some kind of uh, bodily uh, erotica or excess that she showed on screen which was unprecedented, right? Uh, the sinusexuality that she uh, represented and, and uh, 
she became the item number queen also with Zinataman we get this idea this concept of item number for the first time in Bollywood uh, that entirely refashioned Bollywood's commercial cinema and also the middle class gaze right it educated the middle class audience to uh, uh, to to uh, revisit the concept of the Indian heroine the earlier the idea of Indian heroine would be associated with docility with uh, with uh, shyness with uh, you know with with uh, propriety and uh, so forth uh, especially the kinds of films that we see in the 1950s decade like mother india very idealized uh, notions of uh, uh, womanhood motherhood from there a figure like uh, zina taman completely disrupts the uh, traditional values the second part of this song is a corrective measure to the first part which is very interesting it's a kind of uh, the two parts dialogue with one another so one part says dam marudam Mirjayagam. The second part says Ram ka naam badnam nakaro. This uh, line itself means do not desecrate the name of Rama. It is an immediate reparty or response to the song Dham Marudam. It counters the idea of intoxication of substance abuse in the name of uh, love for God. So it rather emphasizes on attempting to bring love for God through a proper understanding of God and uh, his and and uh, his or their teachings so uh, god's understandings and the teachings of god should not be uh, vulgarized or diluted so ram ka naam badnam na karo suggests reading gita for example referring to gita instead of losing one's uh, consciousness and giving away to substance abuse and drugs so the song encourages uh, some normative uh, ideas about social life saying that life is about working do not take rest and through these lyrics it puts at the center the ideals of a productive worldly life a human life that is purposeful that is serving the society however we see that this is also a very modern idea which is uh, not directly linked with the bhakti ideals this utilitarian concept of human life is also a departure from the bhakti worldview and it uh, it is also another kind of uh, dilution of the bhakti culture bhakti saints would normally be uh, quite radical uh, and and not always abide by the social mores and the uh, the, the conventional uh, uh, parameters set by the society so so that way uh, this is also a very uh, contemporary approach uh, uh, that can be seen in the light of uh, nation building how uh, an ideal nation should be built in its post independence era uh, everyone should be working and not take rest right that's the second part of the marudam it is directly uh, contradicting the first part so the first part is about uh, fun frolicking and uh, giving to substance abuse the second part is about being an aware and responsible citizen next we have a song from uh, do chore uh, a film made in 1972 uh, where the song yari ho gayi yaar se very much uh, uh, echoes the uh, the sentiments uh, or uh, the the um, world view uh, that is proposed by the marudam so this phase of cinema in the 1970s marks uh, a uh, a clear dilution and appropriation of the bhakti culture and the bhakti codes uh, in this song we see uh, the female protagonist is uh, actress uh, tanuja who is also miss india she is part of the beauty pageant she is a beauty queen and hence a different uh, kind of sinhi sexuality is observable through her presence uh, this song yari ho gayi yaar se uh, depicts the hippie culture uh, it is located in goa and uh, the hippie culture has properly entered bollywood songs in the era of globalization so it shows uh, the people uh, intoxicated and reveling in a seashore thereby mixing bhakti codes with western values which leads to a, a hybridized effect the protagonists uh, in the song uh, wear westernized clothes uh and uh, they can be seen as reveling in god's names they have the, ru the rudraksh mala around their uh, neck and the tikka uh, that they don 
make them uh, appear as yogis, thereby uh, they, they are focusing on the image of the saint. It is remarkable that uh, these, uh, you know, while, while celebrating the idea of narcotics, they have uh, a picture of Vivekananda somewhere uh, kept at the center uh, of, of this performance. Uh, so, this is a complete subversion and dilution of the, the teachings that uh, saints uh, like uh, Vivekananda had preached. So, from the 1970s, in fact, this trend becomes common in Bollywood. The song encourages a, a, a type of love which is sans any inhibition. It breaks the stereotype of hiding or hesitation and shame. The female uh, protagonist uh, counters the idea of parda or achal, right? So, uh, through this, she is resisting the normative standards of relationship. She encourages living openly, living in a free society and uh, doing things that make her happy. She uh, depicts, she represents a free woman. So, the lines when translated to English go like this, love is not concerned by the world full of lies, religion is about uh, laughing and expressing, we do not know how to hide in achal or veil. So, there is no need to hide anything, there is no need for inhibitions or shame. So, love without shame is also a crucial bhakti element that the song is drawing upon. So, since God is omnipresent, one cannot hide anything from him and live. So, this is a snippet from the song where we see some hippies dressed uh, as saints in the saffron. So, use of saffron, use of rudraksha uh, and then uh, mishmashing it, kind of jamming it with some guitar, uh, some, some uh, hippie dance in the seashore. It uh, heralds the Goan culture, the, the Christian culture that we see in Goa. So, it is a very uh, hybrid effect that emerges through this song. Uh, I would like to stop our lecture here today. Let us continue with this discussion in our next lecture. Thank you.